reminder, Amy, this is going to be recorded. If anyone has any objections, uh, please do message us and let us know and uh, keep your camera off. Um, so uh, I'll come to the recording in two seconds. Um, we have, um, I can't tell you how many we've done. Amy might be able to chirp in on the number that we've done, but we're a way through, maybe seven or eight through already. Um, all of the authors of, of the, each chapter have given us an opportunity to dive back into the chapter. Give us a reminder of what the chapter is like. If you were somebody this time, well, almost this time when it was released December 17th last year, um, that read the book a year ago, then we're diving back into a chapter, particularly tonight, an incredibly interesting chapter. We're eight, eight webinars in. Wow. Um, so we are tonight going to look at uh, chapter seven, common misconceptions of parental involvement in youth sport. Uh, Sam Elliott is joining us all the way from Sydney this morning, 6 a.m., up bright and early. Um, I don't know if people can access the reactions, but I'm going to give Sam a clap on that. Uh, recently appointed associate professor at Flinders University in Adelaide. So, um, and not only are we really keen to hear what he has to say tonight, but we're just privileged to have someone of his caliber join us, share his insights. We've had a little snippet of what's ahead. So um, we're excited, very excited. And for those who have read the chapter, you'll know that he didn't just cover the broad area he, he gave us four misconceptions to challenge our way of thinking whether you're a parent whether you're a coach committee member organization that's thinking about parents involvement in sport or whether indeed you're an athlete who's had an experience with a parent and a coach um, and these kind of misconceptions that were covered were the, um, the parent living vicariously through their child um, addressing bad parents using fines and code systems and diving into that in the chapter um, parents should step back and let the coach deal with the child athlete development in sport and then the types of parents that this this idea that there's types of parents um so there's loads to cover here i don't i don't want to step on sam's toes or bring anything back up from the chapter that's really going to allow us to get into the juicy parts tonight but we will say a massive massive thank you for joining us and thanks uh, sam for having us the recording from tonight, just the initial part, the first 30 minutes, not the Q&A, will go on to the Sequoia Publishers um, YouTube channel as the previous ones had for you to reflect or take it into your environment and use for a good vehicle for conversation. So Amy, have I left anything out before I pass no. over to Sam? Okay, brilliant. I'm going to close off, get my pen and paper ready. Sam, over to you. And if you need anything, just let us know. Okay, thank you very much. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, if not, please just let me know in the chat box. Thanks, Amy. Um, what a fantastic uh, opportunity to join you this evening in the, the UK. I'm sure most of you are, um, are joining us from. And for me, obviously, in Australia, first thing in the morning, it's, um, it's a really exciting opportunity to deep dive into this chapter, Common Misconceptions About Parent Involvement in youth sport and I've specifically written this chapter as insights for coaches um, so really keen to um, to share this with you today um, just gonna hopefully do it. There we go. okay um, maybe just to begin with I'd like to start by acknowledging the land on which I gather and meet with you today um, and I'd like to pay my uh, respects to elders past present and emerging um, and really acknowledge that the land that we meet on um, is those of the First Nations people. So really excited to be here. And as I said, it's a, it's a privilege to join you. Just a quick note. So about the author. Um, so myself, I am a researcher in youth sport parenting, um, but I'm also interested in participatory outcomes. And so this is not just related to psychosocial outcomes for participants, but also in terms of their, um, their continuation behavior and retention. Um, I do straddle an interdisciplinary field. And so my background is actually in education. My honours and PhD to some degree were, I guess, broadly described as sociocultural. Um, but more recently, I found myself publishing in the field of sports psychology. So it's certainly an interesting space. And then I think more practically in terms of the work that's outwardly focused, it tends to be with sport coaches. So it's a very um, it's a very dynamic space and something that I'm um, coming to terms with that I, I don't necessarily identify as a researcher in one field, but across many. 
I do have a young family. I've got two young children, um, five and three years of age. Um, so that's certainly um, a, an exciting part of where I'm at as a, not just as an academic, but as a young man as well. Um, I'm also a podcaster. So if you are on Spotify or, um, or Apple and you're looking for, I guess, academics who are trying to translate research uh, to the masses and specifically research to sporting clubs, um, then maybe beyond the club might be something that is of interest. Um, it is a really, um, I guess it's a passion project and it is certainly a labor of love, but it's something that I'm quite passionate about because a lot of people, as you would appreciate, really struggle to access or to even understand uh, literature. And so our job on the podcast is to bust it down into bite-sized pieces of information uh, with the goal of trying to help clubs become more knowledgeable, more agile, more skilled. Uh, and so that's a really exciting, um, I guess, part of what I do. And then I guess as a final point, outside of family and work and a bit of podcasting, I'm also a football coach at the South Adelaide Football Club. And to give you some context in Australian rules football, um, that's probably the, the tier just under the AFL competition. Um, so it's a very high level um, of professionalised sports. So it's definitely, uh, I guess, a starting point uh, for this conversation. The other point I'd like to make here is just, I guess, how I have, I guess, cultivated a deep interest and passion in family involvement and specifically parents in youth sport. And so I guess it started for me uh, probably as a child, as I reflect on my life so far. This first image is in a city um, named Gyeong Sang Nam Do, which is in South Korea. And what many people may not know about me is that from a very young age, about 11 months, um, I was adopted from South Korea to uh, Australia. Um, and my um, my parents in Australia grew up in a lovely town about five hours south of Adelaide uh, called Mount Gambier. And so Mount Gambier is known for having a beautiful picturesque lake named the Blue Lake. And so spent my uh, childhood growing up in Mount Gambier, uh, played a lot of sport, uh, finished my schooling there. And then sure enough, made my way to Adelaide to study at an undergrad, at an honours and then a PhD level at Flinders University. I've never left. I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but um, I remain there today as an academic. So just a little bit about myself and I guess how I come to this research. Really excited to talk about parents and youth sport. And the first thing I want to highlight is that they are just one cog, a very important cog, but just one piece of a much larger interrelated system and so when we talk about parenting this evening um what I'm, i guess one of the points i want to i guess um reiterate from the beginning is that while parents do play a crucial role um from the outset and across the journey they are just one piece that that works in sync with a number of other interrelated gears and systems and so i think the the lesson there might initially be that when we are talking about parents, when we are researching parents in sport, when we are seeking to improve and optimise those environments for families to thrive and to support their children, we need to think of persons and contexts as systemic and interrelated. And Travis Dorsch and his colleagues have produced this wonderful heuristic, which um, for me is my go-to, um, if you like, conceptual map of how I continue to understand parenting. Um, rather than viewing parents as a siloed entity or a siloed part of the experience, very much an integrated piece. The other point I'd like to make from the outset is that there is a history of research on parent involved in youth sport. And Travis led a fantastic team, Sam Thrower, Camilla Knight, some fantastic colleagues and uh, great thinkers in this space, really, really strong leaders in the field. Uh, as well as emerging researchers, Emily and Valeria. So there's a really exciting team that came together to undertake this review. And what we actually, uh, I guess, highlighted in this paper was that there is a long and strong history of six or seven, nearly seven decades of research on parenting in sport. Uh, and yet what we actually see in 2022, when certainly when we consult and when we work with sporting clubs, is that a lot of that knowledge and a lot of that great information and insight hasn't really moved from bench to bedside or from the, the literature into the field. Um, and so what we are able to do is sort of demarcate three periods of research, certainly in those early years, um, which we, um, I guess, mark by the, the 1968 to 1981 period, was that there was a lot of 
I guess, initial interest in the role of parents in socialising children into sport. And that was something that we probably do understand that parents' interest in sport can drive the way in which children become socialised, as well as the nature of parent encouragement. Um, there was also early interest in the role of mothers and fathers, and there's certainly a little bit of uh, interest in the way in which um, that might impact socialisation and participation as well. And the other point, and there were a couple of others, but I'm just quickly giving you a, a summary here, is how parenting practices affect children's perceptions of their sporting ability. And so again, I think even in 2022, there's probably a, a sense of understanding that yeah, we, we see a bit of that um, play out you know, in, in the practice. So that's certainly um, the foundational period as a, a starting point. Um, I encourage you to find this paper. It's a really good read and a really strong review uh, of the field to date. The transitional period that we identified was sort of um, at the beginning of the 1980s, right up to, and this is probably more specifically, 1998. So what are the things that we tended to learn about? Well, we knew that there was some more solidification of trajectories um, for the interests in parents in sport. We certainly saw a trend to include parents in the research, which was a really exciting thing that we continue to see today. Um, there was also a really... No, um, novel, I guess, finding around this concept of reverse socialisation. And so this is that concept where parents, of course, are involved in socialising their children into sport, but parents are too socialised by their children's involvement, their attitudes, their preferences, their behaviours, uh, and of course, their competencies that they might display across the journey. And that can certainly maybe influence the way in which parents are involved as well. Um, there was also a very keen interest in the maintenance of gendered stereotyping, gendered attitudes when it came to parents' uh, roles in socialising both sons and daughters into sport, um, as well as uh, a keen interest in the, I guess, the child outcomes as a result of parenting. And so one of the things that tended to really take shape was the interest in participatory outcomes, so continuation and even dropout behaviour or attrition. Um, self-esteem, anxiety, effect and enjoyment, so some more psychosocial outcomes, as well as the application and even the testing of some motivational theories to learn about the orientations of the individuals and the motivational climate. So this was a really significant period of uh, the research when it comes to parenting in youth sport. 1999 to sort of where we are at present was really, I guess, um, initiated by Jean Cote's paper, um, the influence of um, family on talent development, a really significant paper, a highly cited paper. And what it really did was help us to think more about these, um, these trajectories of parenting in youth sport um, that became predominant research interests. And so there was certainly a strong um, body of work that started to look at the socio-contextual characteristics which can explain or certainly contextualise our understanding about parents in sport. Things like socioeconomic position, educational attainment as, as just a couple of examples. Um, we also saw a growing increase in the interest on children as well as others' perceptions of parent behaviour and parent involvement. There continued to be a growth of motivational theory um, or the application uh, of motivational theory to explain patterns and outcomes in children. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important, and for those that are, are well read in this space, would really appreciate the work of uh, Camilla Knight and a lot of the, the people that she's collaborated with over the, certainly over the last 10 to 15 years, um, which have really looked at some of the factors which influence parents' involvement. Um, and a couple of the papers that I really enjoyed, Knight and Holt, um, Burgess and colleagues, um, as well as Chris Harwood and, and Camilla's earlier papers, which started to look at the personal, the organisational and the competitive stresses that parents encounter. And these papers for me really shifted the parameters of the field because they started to illuminate the complexity and the challenge that faces many parents and families. Um, and so there'll be more on that in just a moment. Um, and then I guess as a final point, the contemporary period really saw the birth of a number of um, I guess, questions around, well, what do we do from here? What are the answers? What's the next step? Uh, and there are a number of academics in this space that I could cite here, but Sam Thrower is just one example. 
uh, Travis has done a lot of work as well, are these educational interventions, which are really designed to provide parents um, with the informational uh, support and the educational advice uh, to make their way through the sporting journey and ultimately to optimise the nature of their involvement. The reason I wanted to start with that before jumping into the chapter is for highlighting, I guess, the, the long and strong history of research in this area, but often it doesn't translate. And so one of the first things that I wanted to try on uh, Zoom at the moment is to invite you into this discussion early. You probably at some point in your career, or maybe you do this as part of your work and consultancy, engage with sporting clubs. And when the topic of parents come up, um, I wanted to start the conversation by asking you, what is it that, that I guess emerges in those conversations? How are parents typically described? So what I might do to maybe facilitate this is you can choose to use the chat box, uh, or maybe if you would like to um, maybe raise your hand and um, I'm not sure if we want to facilitate this, Amy or Jenny, um, but just maybe um, briefly in 15, 20 seconds, just describe the words or the notions or the ideologies that come to mind when we talk about parents. So um, hopefully you guys are keen to do some sharing. I know it's late in the evening, but um, let's see how we go. It's um, in our sport, it's often described as dealing with the parents. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm just going to, um, I'm just taking a moment. I'm just going to have a look at some of the, the, the comments here. So emotional. Uh, so Anita North. Um, yeah, absolutely. That's definitely one that comes to mind that it's a highly emotive uh, context that we find ourselves in. It is an achievement domain. And as a result, there can tend to be um, perceptions that parents are simply an emotional part um, of this journey. Um, dealing with parents. Yeah, absolutely. Um, have we so how we see this or how or others uh, we have worked with. Um, so, so just to clarify the question, um, in terms of how others that you've worked with might describe parents. So you may be facilitating a session or doing some coach development. Um, what are the kind of things, um, Chappie, that, that your participants, your stakeholders would describe parents as? Over-involved, hard work, a pain, as a resource to support children's participation. Excellent, thank you. Um, and then a resource, but I didn't always think like that in my early career, absolutely. Um, overbearing, needing to be nurtured, disruptive, absolutely. So one of the things I like about that is that um, someone or a couple of people describe parents as, well, they are maybe seen as a really great resource and an underutilized resource um, in youth sport. So we'll certainly come around to that uh, in a moment. But again, you can see here, in your own experiences that there's certainly um, a, a tendency for this automatic and a default uh, way of thinking about parenting in sport. It is absolutely complicated. Um, so again, the, the Zoom user's contribution there is, is absolutely uh, on point. It is a very complex and intricate social experience. And um, often these uh, automatic default ways of thinking are unhelpful um, and I'll unpack that in just a moment. And Margaret also made a comment. I think they're an important part of the support package. So I get to know them, but others see them as a nuisance, interfering with the coaching. Yeah, absolutely. Um, they need to have reality checks, level of expectation might not match the current situation. Yeah, brilliant. So what I'm going to do is use those, I guess, ideas and those experiences, those perceptions um, as, I guess, a way of juxtaposing the chapter. And I guess in working with um, Amy and Jenny to pull this chapter together, I was really keen to um, reflect on a couple of points. One of which is also this socio-cultural representation of parenting, because I think we need to ask ourselves, where do these perceptions come from? Overbearing, um, we have to deal with parents, um, that they may have high expectations, that they're emotional. Where does that come from? And I think a lot of it may be through perceived and even learnt experience. Um, but I think there's also larger reinforcing factors in broader society and culture. And certainly in some of the work that I've published, I make comment on this, that we cannot ignore 
that there are examples in popular discourse and there are examples in the way in which, for example, news media represent the conversation about parents in sport. And so it very much restricts this conversation or limits this conversation um, to these very um, dyadic and these very um, simplified, if you like, ideologies about parenting in sport. So that's certainly something that I think is worth unpacking. Um, and I'll, I'll make a full 360 degree link to this later. Okay, so thank you for that very elongated introduction to chapter seven. I wanted to highlight that because the impetus for this particular chapter was actually um, on the basis of the workshop that I delivered with coaches. And the first thing we spoke about um, was the way in which we see parents. And it was a very dyadic, um, or, or sorry, dichotomous conversation. So on the one hand, there was a strong debate that parents were a problem. They are in need of repair. We need to remedy the issues that they present. But on the other hand, as a couple of you have mentioned, it is complex. We need to empathize. We need to understand. We need to work with. And so there was these polarizing conversations. And I thought, well, that's, that's quite interesting. And so I wanted to maybe use that as the foundation to write this chapter on um, some misconceptions uh, or some misunderstandings about parents' involvement in sport. The first misconception that I wanna unpack is this notion that parents live vicariously through their children and that is the reason they behave in a particular way. So one of the things I wanna do in this chapter was really, I guess, um, get my teeth into this to some degree. And the first point I wanna make is that there are other pieces of the puzzle that are forgotten by adopting this automatic explanation, okay, that parents just are reliving their childhood experiences through sport and they are trying to fulfill their childhood through their children. Um, and I think one of the reasons why this notion falls short is because there's simply too many pieces of literature which I think creates a much larger problem of the complexity and even some of the driving motivations for parents' involvement. Um, we do know that parents' behaviours have been found to impact, also to be impacted by their own social ambitions. But those social ambitions aren't necessarily about um, unfulfilled childhood goals or aspirations. Sometimes their social ambitions actually relate to the present day. And it's the need for their child to fit in. It's their need for their child to make friends. We also know that parents have shown a tendency to actually adapt their goals. So if parents were vicariously motivated through their child's sport, then one of the things that we could expect to see is a rigid, um, if you like, commitment to the way in which they involve themselves and support their child. The research has actually shown that along the journey, parents adapt their goals and they adapt their expectations in relation to their child's involvement in sport. We also know, as I've highlighted earlier, um, there's a lot of research that looks at the, the range of stresses that parents encounter, which can also influence the nature of their involvement. And so it starts to expand our understanding well beyond this idea of vicarious involvement that can serve to explain the way in which parents become involved. We know that parents harbor concerns about coaching practices. We also know that they are concerned and have demonstrated, I, I guess, a hesitation to become involved because of a lack of knowledge, uncertainty even about how to behave. Um, and we also know that in some cases uh, and in some roles, such as that of the parent coach, um, when you're wearing two hats, parents can actively disadvantage their own child. And often that's driven by a fear of how they are perceived by others. They do not want to um, be concerned with the perception that they are favoring their own child. And so they tend to display some behaviors that disadvantage their own child. These, um, these pieces of the puzzles don't necessarily... I guess, compound the idea of a vicariously motivated individual um, involved in their child's sport. So there are certainly other pieces of the puzzle. And the lesson that I want to highlight here is that vicarious experience falls short. It's not a complete um, starting point or even finishing point for the way in which we theorise parents' involvement in sport. So what does it mean? Well, there's a couple of things. I think firstly, simplistic explanations for inappropriate behaviours uh, or inappropriate forms of involvement do not necessarily stand up to scientific scrutiny. As I've highlighted, and there are certainly a number of other examples, there are so many pieces of this complex puzzle that can explain, um, and although we don't have a lot of research on this, have the potential to even predict the way in which parents might be involved in sport. 
I think the thing that that it might come across a little bit um, uh, uh, forceful, but one of the things that continually comes to mind is that maybe it's an impoverished argument. I make the logical equivalence that when students come to university, those who fail my topics are simply lazy. And if we were to apply that logic in sport, we could say, well, you know what, Sam, there's actually a lot of reasons why students may not have the kind of success to get through topics in any given semester, for example. They could be going through a range of um, personal challenges, as just one example. Um, and so it, it's an example of the need to understand more fully the circumstances which may um, in, influence parents' involvement. Often, um, we see um, the, I guess, the notion of Occam's razor, which is this notion of uh, the most expedient, efficient answer or explanation for a social phenomenon. Uh, and so that's something that I would caution us against because uh, clearly the, the weight of evidence highlights uh, a much more complex picture. Um, and Camilla's written a lot about this, but um, has put it beautifully and so succinctly that it's a complex and an intricate social experience um, and we need to treat it as such. <coughs> Pardon me. Okay, um, so one of the points that I make in this chapter about this myth is that we should be encouraging coaches and clubs to move away from these very simplified explanations and interpretations towards a more comprehensive understanding and appreciation for the factors that might influence parents' involvement. What does that do? I think the first thing it might do is invite or open a more empathetic approach um, and I think that's really key when we're trying to work with parents as opposed to on or against. Okay, misconception number two. Often what we might see, certainly in Australia, and I'd imagine globally, this tends to be something that you would see from time to time, the adoption of fines um, or punitive measures, the adoption of policies such as codes of behaviour, codes of conduct, and even some policing measures from time to time, Silent Saturday, in New South Wales, there's a very prominent shush campaign. And these are, if you like, restrictive or um, practices that are highly policed and highly regulated um, in youth sport. And one of the misconceptions that I wanted to write about in this chapter is really about um, the notion that these are the solution for managing parents, or these are the solutions for um, troubleshooting issues that parents present in youth sport. What we uh, tend to see is the adoption of these as what Dawes describes as quick fix solutions, they're convenient solutions, they're things that when you audit a club or when you review your club's progress at the end of the year, stack up on paper. We had 700 parents sign our code of behaviour, we gave out 30 fines this year, um, we had only three complaints that escalated to the state level. And so it's a very measurable um commitment to trying to improve the sport experience for children and the way in which that happens tends to be through the management i'm using that word deliberately here the management of parents um, but i wanted to unpack some of these because there are certainly some unintended challenges and this is why i think it's a misconception that fines codes of conduct even policing measures are a viable solution in and of itself i think there's another piece that is missing when it comes to restrictive measures, so things like Silent Saturday, these practices that govern what we can and cannot do, one of the things that tends to happen with Silent Saturdays is the complete removal of sideline verbal involvement. And while that may sound um, like a, a reasonable solution, it also removes positive comments in some of the ways in which these interventions are implemented. Now, not all of them I need to mention um, discourage positive comments. Sometimes it's really a, a message to consider what you say. But we do see some um, restrictive measures where there are no verbal comments from the sideline permitted during weekend sport. And I just wanted to highlight one of the consequences of removing those positive comments. If you actually look at the literature on funds, so a lot of Amanda Vasek's work um, has highlighted a range of, if you like, sources that children have self-identified as sources of fun one of which are the positive comments that they receive from parents and adults in their youth sport experience. And we don't know necessarily whether that's outside or inside of sport, but as you continue to interview children and learn more about what they do enjoy, there are certainly some children that enjoy the positive feedback and the positive comments in situ. And so I think one of the risks of that is, does that diminish even by 
some degree the level of fun and enjoyment that children's experience. Um, and so there's certainly, I think, an unintentional consequence that we need to think through. Uh, and so there's an opportunity for more research there. There are also some practical issues. So if you implement a silent Saturday intervention, who's going to police that? What training have they completed? What level of certainty do you have that they will be able to enforce or govern this particular intervention? And I think temporality matters because certainly on a Saturday morning in Australia, um, at nine o'clock and under 12 games of Australian football has a very different um, contextual environment that surrounds the game compared to, you know, say three o'clock in the afternoon with an under 17 competition. And so there are some restrictive um, challenges that I think um, need to be thought through. And again, we need probably a little bit more research in this area to fully understand the impact uh, of these um, of these interventions. I've written a little bit about this. So most clubs will adopt pledges or codes of conduct at the beginning of the season. But my research has found that there's actually reduced significance of these policy measures as the season culminates towards the end of um, a competition, which is usually finals, making interstate or interleague teams, best and fairest awards. And so there's certainly a high emphasis from day one or early in the season. Um, and then there is inconsistent um, emphasis and impact uh, in terms of its perceived effectiveness um, you know, across the season. So there's certainly some, I guess, unintended consequences for its implementation. Some practical issues. So certainly in the interpretation, codes of conduct, of conduct that I've analysed will say things like, um, be a supportive and encouraging um, part of our environment. And so the thing that I think is really challenging here is that we often leave to chance the notion that it's just common sense, that parents should know what support and fun and encouragement look like uh, when we write it into a policy. Uh, and yet that, again, it, it probably fails on some level to stand up to both social and scientific scrutiny because there are multiple ways in which fun may be experienced. Um, and again, I, I reference Amanda's work on that. Um, and meaning and context also matter because in some sports, it's absolutely culturally appropriate to say nothing from the sideline. Golf is one example. Uh, and yet in other sports, there may be a more forgiving or more historically ingrained discourse of sideline involvement in sport. And so I just think that the way in which the codes in and of themselves play a role in working to create a safe and supportive environment um, requires more work. The other one that I haven't seen a lot of, but it's been written about a little bit, is this notion of punitive measures. So if parents behave or misbehave um, in, in youth sport, what do we do about it? And it might be banning them from games. There could be monetary fines. But one of the things that I think is really difficult about employing this type of measure is that it's counterintuitive to current perspectives. We don't want to find parents and alienate them. We actually want to work with them. We want to understand their stresses, their challenges, um, and try and find ways to help them through that and to equip them with the, the coping mechanisms and the informational support to be a part of the journey. So those punitive measures tend to, I guess, go against what we're advocating for in a lot of the literature. Some of the practical issues, if you do employ these punitive measures, I wonder if over the course of the season, a $20 fine or a $50 fine might actually, in some situations, be worth it. It might be worth putting off that child and saying something um, that is clearly going to negatively impact that sport experience, but it's only worth $50 and the stakes are worth it. I wonder if there are some practical issues there for some parents who may see it as, as a worthwhile um, punitive consequence um, in certain situations. So there's certainly a lot more research here that highlights um, the, the need to, to maybe not overemphasize uh, the importance of fines, codes of conduct and policing measures. What does this all mean? Well, certainly quick fix solutions come with a range of practical challenges. And I think they certainly um, would be employed with caution because we don't have a lot of um, evidence base for their effectiveness. <coughs> Pardon me, I've woken up with a bit of a cough. Um, we need to also ask ourselves, how are we setting up families for success from day one? And I'll, I'll speak more about this at the end if there's time on a current project that I'm leading. 
And so in the chapter, what have I written about this? Well, one of the things is that when you adopt these punitive, restrictive or contractual measures, they may not be best practice, given that they are potentially a theoretical, they're reactive strategies, and they are, again, these convenient solutions for an inherently complex social problem uh, or phenomenon in youth sport. So it's certainly something to temper uh, enthusiasm for these particular methods. What is the piece that's missing? Well, again, in the last seven years, there's been a very strong advocacy for investment and development of educational and informational support. There are so many of these programs and so much research which have sought to um, look at the process or impact or even outcome evaluations of these programs. Um, and so without going through all of these, um, just highlighting that there is a movement in this direction. Uh, but one of the things that it highlights is a slow and concerted effort towards working with parents and avoiding that quick fix convenient approach. The last point I'll make here is that education in and of itself shouldn't be separate from, for example, a well-developed policy. Um, it's usually not a conversation of one or the other, um, but certainly a combination or an integrated um, approach to youth sport. Okay, misconception three. Okay, so parents should step back and let coaches take over once children sort of find their feet in the sporting journey. Um, this is certainly something that was identified in Cote's earlier work, um, especially as children shift from those sampling to specialising uh, years of development. Um, and it's the preferred argument in many ways when I work with coaches because they perceive parents to, um, I guess, be potential or to be a potential um, thwarting influence on their child's development. They can certainly undermine um, their development from a parent, from a coaching point of view. But there's also research which shows the nature and some of the benefits of parents adapting as opposed to reducing their involvement across the journey. Uh, and so a research paper that I published a couple of years ago with um, my colleagues, Murray Drummond and Camilla Knight, um, looked at those that moved into a talent pathway, these young kids that had moved into um, a, a pathway of accelerated development. And in these programs, we spoke to these kids about what is it that you want parents to know? What do you want parents to understand about your transition into a more professionalised version of youth sport, um, which is not without its challenges, of course. And one of the things that commonly came up is the need for parents to understand it is difficult, but we need a highly tailored version of social support on this journey. We're going to have changing social circles. We've seen that already. I now need to navigate my motivation for a dual career. I'm still in school, but I'm now in this specialised program. And so parents don't need to necessarily take a step backwards. They need to maintain their involvement in this paper, um, as we've highlighted, but adapt the way in which they are involved. So the misconception that parents take a step back, let the coaches take over, is one that I certainly wanted to challenge. So what does this mean? Well, I think for parents to successfully adapt their involvement across the journey, um, Maita Verusa has a really good paper that was published only a couple of years ago, which looked at the sampling years. And what are the things that parents can do to adapt their involvement across those early years? Um, some of Camilla's earlier work in the specialising years has then shown a way in which it might shift. And you can see in these descriptors of the behaviours or the ways in which parents can be involved, there is a way in which parents can adapt their involvement, but it might not necessarily be um, a, a reduction uh, or a step backwards. It might just be an adaptation. And as I've mentioned, in high-performing um, environments, um, parents might need to display a different level of involvement or a different type of involvement um, in those contexts. And so the way in which I describe this might be leaning in and leaning out of different forms of involvement, but it's not necessarily a net reduction. It's not necessarily a decrease of parenting involvement, but simply a modification of role and responsibility. The final misconception, okay? So what type of parents will I encounter this season? Often coaches will say to me, Sam, I can summarize parents the minute I see them. From the first conversation, from the first week of training, I can typecast them. And as a result, I have a plan on how I'm going to uh, work with them this season. And I often want to question, firstly, where does that come from? Where do those typology-based um, behaviours come from? And are they useful? And so firstly, to answer the first question, where do they come from? 
John C. Helstead wrote a lot of um, early literature for practitioners. A lot of it was in, um, in skiing. Um, but one of his interesting papers early on really characterized parents as the under involved, under involved, the moderately involved or the over involved parent, and provided descriptors of each of these typologies of parents. We've seen that sort of transition across the years because certainly Omli and Wies Bjornstuhl wrote a fantastic paper about the roles that parents play in sport and they conceptualize the supportive parent, the demanding coach and the crazed fan. Um, and again, you see this again in, in Small and colleagues' paper. Um, they wrote a really interesting paper for practitioners around the common um, parents that, that, that coaches may encounter. And so there's, again, a typology of parenting there. And then more recently, Van Mullen and Cole um, authored a fantastic uh, paper, not fantastic in my view in terms of what the paper contributes to the field, but a fantastic part of um, I guess this debate around whether we should use typologies of parents in sport um, and so in strategies I think that journal was it was again a coaching and practitioner focused journal um, which highlighted about six or seven types of parents that parents can expect to encounter and what you should do to manage their involvement so this probably understand this understanding answers the first question about where that comes from um, but it doesn't necessarily um, I guess, answer the question about, is it useful? And one of the things that I wanted to really dive into in this chapter is what are the consequences of adopting that type of thinking as a coach? And I highlight this first point. If typologies were useful, if those um, categories of parents were absolutely the way coaches should approach parents in sport, do coaches actually have the training, the skills and the experience to actually implement the associated advice? Um, we need to think that coaches, certainly at community levels, are primarily volunteers. And in those spaces, there's usually a high seasonal or annual turnover of the parent coach. And so I just wonder if those types of parents, those types of coaches that we're working with, do they actually have the training? Do they have the skills and the experience to actually go forth with that advice and act on these typologies? I'm not sure that they do. And that's something that O'Connor, I believe, had written about in 2011 as a counter to one of these papers. The next point, what are the risks of building relationships between parents and coaches if we start from a position of categorization? And I think the equivalent example in another achievement domain might be in schools or universities. Could you imagine students from day one uh, at university or schools being typecast I actually think a better approach might be to start with a blank canvas. Instead of pigeonholing parents, let's have an open mind and inquiry-based approach, be open to the possibilities and the resources and skills that parents can contribute to this journey. Um, and there's certainly a paper that one of my PhD students has published this year about how we might start to build these relationships between parents and coaches in youth sport. Certainly one thing that coaches and clubs can do is celebrate and communicate the informal as well as the formal credentials of the individual. You don't need to be a high level athlete coming down to the local level um, to be, I guess, considered an expert coach or a, 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 an effective coach at those levels. Um, there's a way in which Kaylee has written beautifully about some of the informal credentials that matter for parents. Sharing goals, values, expectations. We need to open up opportunities for that. This is the blank canvas approach um, and, and filling those, I guess, those narratives in together. Maybe looking at how we can support coaches to develop some relational boundaries because of course it is a demanding role um, and it's something that we want to be sensitive about when we're asking coaches to consider adopting a more empathetic uh, uh, you know, way forward with parents, uh, as well as exploring the idea of an intermediary support. Okay, So maybe we need some other resources to enhance the communication between parents and coaches. So there's certainly some literature there starting to build around what we can do to start to, uh, I guess, close the gap and, and onboard families into that sporting journey. I am conscious of time. So Jenny or Amy, please let me know um, if you want to jump in from here. But I might just very quickly, if I can, go through a couple of slides. Where do we go from here? And I think um, one of the things that I wanted to come back to is that piece of cultural representations and how, how are our club environments setting up families from day one? And so I actually had this study funded by a state government and a number of state sporting organisations to really look at um, how we might set up parents from the beginning of the journey. Our rationale was really simple, that especially during COVID, parents have been 
thrust at the you know to the forefront of, of, of sport provision we know that parents are a key part of rebuilding the volunteer workforce we also know um, in a lot of the literature and again in our chat that parents can be perceived to be overbearing emotional etc um, but we also know that on the flip side parents feel undervalued and unsupported and often that is owing to these very narrow views about the way in which we should have parents involved in sport um, and it kind of reinforces the notion that parents are kind of a problematic part of this journey. So we've developed this amazing uh, research study, which led to this um, creative graphic of things that we could do to potentially onboard parents into the sporting journey. If I can very briefly go through what we were trying to do, effectively, um, and again, conscious of time, we wanted to learn about how are sporting clubs setting up parents for success. So we undertook a rapid ethnography, a very intensified form of field work that involved 300 hours of covert fly on the wall observations across a number of sporting clubs. This is specific to the first eight weeks of the sporting season. We wanted to see in a naturalistic setting, how do clubs, how do coaches engage families? How do they engage parents? And then we followed up with a number of interviews with parents and coaches. Um, some findings. Well, in terms of some observations, we found a very superficial and a very transactional interaction with parents from the outset. Sign this code of behaviour, pay us this money, join these apps so we can communicate with you and make sure that you know when we train, when we play and when our social events are. And so we conceptualised this notion of the relationship bank. And we use the word bank specifically because the first thing that coaches and clubs are doing at the start of this sporting journey is asking parents to actually do things uh, and give up time. And they effectively, coaches that is, the coaches are effectively withdrawing from this sporting journey. Um, I noticed there's a couple of comments there, so I'll just keep going and hopefully catch them in just a moment. Some findings, well, uh, a lot of things came up in um, this data. I'm not gonna read the quotes, you can look at them for yourself, um, but parents are yearning for more social interaction. And so the proliferation of technology and application technology automation certainly is something that um, has great utility, but it's still a social experience that parents want face-to-face -face interaction with. Parents also want to actually be acknowledged for the work that they do. And certainly a recent paper in Australia has highlighted the need to uh, thank parents for trusting your club and your coaches with, um, with, I guess, entrusting them with, I guess, the responsibility of working with their child. Um, there's also parents that remain on the periphery. They don't know how to help. They don't know how to be involved. And as a result, they are those that are most risk of, if you like, withdrawing uh, and reducing their involvement, a, a misconception that I've, I've tried to challenge tonight. Um, we also know in some of these data that there is a perception in the clubs that, hey, our reality is that we just get who we can get. And so if coaches aren't prepared to be empathetic or to engage parents from the outset, we've just got to roll with it because we've got to take what we can get. Um, and so there is, again, certainly some um, perceived practical challenges there as well. As well as, I guess, some insights and experiences, which highlights um, the need that clubs and coaches are lacking resources, they're lacking tools. And so educational face-to-face -face presentation models are not enough. We need to make sure that we're equipping these clubs with more informational support um, because they simply do not have the skills in a lot of instances to manage um, the, the way in which coaches will build relationships with the family unit. So what can coaches do? Well, they can share their story. Parents want knowledge, they want story, they want connection. They don't necessarily wanna know how many athletes have gone on to the elite level that you have coached. Personalize the learning experience. Certainly they, they want to feel like their names are known and you understand where they work, how difficult it might be to get to training some nights. They just want you to personalize that experience. And the adjacent example might be when you board a plane, how personalized that onboarding experience it is for you. They know that is flight attendants. They, they, they know your name, they know your seat. They greet you with a smile. They are absolutely there to help you settle into that flight. And so I'd love to see an equivalent personalized onboarding experience um, into that sporting journey, because that's what our participants, parents and coaches um, appear to, to be in need of. Practicing gratitude and publishing, publicly acknowledging the family efforts to support children. So saying thank you should be the first impulse, not the thing that we say at the end of the season when we're wrapping up best and fairest evenings. 
parents want to feel like they have a second home and a family that is check or a community that is checking in on not just the child, but the family unit. And a lot of the parents' stresses and challenges in life are also felt by children. And so prioritizing well-being on family and not just the player uh, might be a stretch goal for many clubs, but something that is important to families. And to communicate the benefits, a lot of families do not understand the holistic benefits of sport. They may not know that there are 38 well-documented psychosocial uh, benefits of prolonged engagement in sport. So benefits can be physical, of course, but psychosocially, but also in terms of some of the positive youth development literature um, and primarily around character development. I think those kind of things are vastly underestimated uh, in youth sport and something that is a, a really important tool in building those conversations early. And the other thing that parents and coaches spoke about is maybe the opportunity to open up more periodic exchanges for ideas, maybe sharing concerns and talking about some of the more encouraging aspects of the practice of which there are many. Uh, and so again, we just think of the school environment, which um, again is an achievement domain. Um, there is certainly in Australia, opportunities for parent-teacher interviews. It's a very formalised part of the connection between parents and families. I wonder what that might look like. The equivalent example might look like in youth sport. Could there be um, some opportunities early in the season when parents are really coming into this journey and then maybe opportunities um, you know, at more set times across the year. There is a time impediment there for many coaches, so it's something that we need to work through, but certainly the need for more exchange formally and informally is worth thinking about. So what does that look like? Well, instead sorry, of withdrawing Sam, from this relationship... Sorry, Sam, I'm just going to uh, jump in there. I my, I don't know about everybody else. My wrist is hurting from the amount of notes that I'm making and the smile that's on my face, but I've, I am very conscious that we've only got six minutes left. Excellent. And we haven't heard Excellent from anyone questions. in the chat, but I know <laughs> that there will be people who have um, some comments, some scenarios that they'd like to share. So if we leave this slide here and we could encourage people to ask something in the chat box or even to give your voice a rest very briefly and to have a look at the, the chat to see if there's anything there that draws your attention. Um, and we'd encourage people to say, right, you know, that lands, that doesn't land, it's useful. Um, obviously, we don't want takeaways. We want to give people time to process the incredible volume of information um, and insight that Sam has given us. Um, Absolutely. So, yep. Yeah, if, if you don't mind doing that, and I would, yeah. Has, has anybody got any questions? Has anybody got any thoughts? Um, does it does it relate or resonate anything that, that we've looked at? Is there any scenario that you're currently going through that you'd be happy to, to share and as, a, as a, a group that we have here this evening, we could have a brief conversation about it. Jen, there's a great point in the chat about, is there an, a, an issue around the assumption of who owns or is responsible for the sporting experience? Um, I wow. thought that was a, a really nice kind of uh, question. Sam, I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great question, but even academically um, in research hasn't been given the attention that it deserves. So right now, um, there's certainly, I think, a tension between um, researchers who are effectively the knowledge generators um, in scholarship, but there are also on the ground um, great practitioners who are living and breathing these experiences um, from the outset. And so there's certainly a tension there in terms of um, the way in which some of these ideas translate. But I think there's also, and, and if I'm answering this question correctly, um, there's also more work that is needed to really learn about the responsibility for this, um, this dynamic, this interpersonal dynamic that manifests in and through sport. Um, is it the clubs? Is it vested with the individual? Um, and that's probably something that I would maybe caution against saying that this is a parent-specific issue or a parent-specific phenomenon about responsibility. Um, I think there's a much more dynamic interplay between environment, and I think I referenced Travis's work here. There's a, a lot of literature in the systems-based approach that I think is worth tapping into, um, because if we ignore that, it kind of defers responsibility to a particular stakeholder, and I'm not sure that that's useful. So two levels there, one in terms of knowledge generation and how that might um, translate into the field, but there might be another issue in terms of, um, I guess, enactment of that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. And um, if anyone else has got any questions, please feel free to jump in. Um, 
I've got a, a question or a thought. I think, Sam, we've been working on a project together with the RFL in the UK and um, colleagues, have, we've been having a lot of discussions around, you know, uh, parental behaviour, um, how that's impacting on, on the organisation. And it's, I think we started the project, or, or we did in the UK, with quite a negative lens. You know, there's a problem, it's, it's the parents that are a problem, and, and let's look for the, the negative behaviours. But there's also the question around parents are giving up a lot of time to bring their, their children to, to a game. So the experience has also got to be kind of worthwhile for the parent. So I think I'm just going off what, you, what you've just said there, but it's not just about, you know, what is, it, what is the impact on the child? Well, what is the impact on the parent and what is it about the parent's experience? And it's a two-way interaction. Um, so I guess kind of banning parent uh, involvement could really like dampen the parent parental experience which could then have a knock-on effect onto the child experience as well yeah absolutely and certainly in australia a, a colleague of mine orally pankowiak just published a a fantastic piece of research on um uh, well it, it's fantastic in in many ways but it's a it's a really frightening piece of work that looks at psychological um physical and sexual violence in youth sport in australia um, and there were some really damning statistics. 38% of uh, respondents um, had experienced sexual violence. 76% had experienced some form of psychological violence. Um, and so it, I, I raise this point because it's a big deal. It matters when families bring a child into this sporting journey and parents are vesting a lot of responsibility and a lot of trust in the clubs. And I think that needs to be respected rather than just an assumed part of childhood development. Um, so we really need to appreciate that. And parents, again, they they they, they want to feel connected with the, the journey, but they want to feel that this decision uh, is respected because it is a big challenge and it's certainly a big part of uh, the family, uh, you know, the family dynamic. Thanks, Sam. I've, I've got another question. <laughs> if anyone else, if anyone has got a question, please put your hand up, take yourself off mute, feel free to ask. Um, but Sam, do you think that, again, just going back to my own experience of working on this project and coming out from a very, very negative perspective. So we, we've gone out and we've observed parents what on the sideline, but actually we haven't really observed that many negative behaviours and we've observed 99.9% .9 really nice behaviour and really nice environments. Um, do you find that that's similar within kind of your own research? It's that real small um like that one or two isolated event events that really kind of create this negative impact or view of, of parents and sport yeah it, it's this is for me a great opportunity for research because i would reference um shields and colleagues work from sort of 2006 2007 as some of the more compelling quantitative evidence around the nature of parenting in sport um, and even some of the studies which have looked at the verbal comments that are made from the sideline. Um, so I think in both of these trajectories of research, when it comes to Shields' work, you are correct. The vast majority of parents exhibit um, very low percentage, um, if you like, antecedents of bad parenting behaviour. Um, and so I think that's something that's not to be forgotten in this conversation. The vast majority of parents... Um, are well-intentioned, want to be uh, involved in a productive and supportive way, um, sometimes just don't know how, and sometimes don't have the skills to cope when stresses emerge. Um, the other research which has looked at some of the comments would show that around between 15 and 40% of all verbalisations from the sideline are either negative or instructional in nature. Negative or instructional doesn't necessarily mean abusive, but they can obviously be a challenge for children and they can certainly be a challenge for coaches. So I just think that there's some work here um, to build up parents and to build their capacity to be involved in the ways that we want. Um, but you are correct in uh, the observation that a lot of parents, the vast majority, tend to do the right thing. And there's a really good paper in 1992 that I want to just highlight here as a final point. Um, one incident, I guess this is some way it could be a counter example, but one incident of bad parenting can certainly have a lifelong consequence for that individual. But that, that one incident is experienced by certainly in Australian football, 40 kids in that one moment. 
maybe 400, you know, uh, or not 400, maybe 200 observers, you know, in that environment, spectators, parents, volunteers, et cetera. And so the conversation around parenting and the way in which they are behaving poorly starts to become quite a um, compounded conversation from that one incident. So it's certainly something that we need to maybe just temper um, as we talk about uh, the antecedents and frequency. Yeah. Great point, Sam. Thanks so much for that. I'm just conscious of time. I'm going to, Jess has got a hand up, so we'll um, go for the last question from Jess uh, and then we'll wrap up. Jess, do you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, I tried to type it out, but it got too complicated, so <laughs> I thought I'd um, ask it. Um, so my sport is sailing, so we've got the advantage where you don't have kind of parents from the sideline. Um, when you're on the water, it's very much you and a coach, but I guess kind of a challenge I've had is I feel like we engage parents quite well um, but my kind of experiences since COVID they've um, parents are generally much more involved in um, what their children are doing and ultimately it's a good thing but it's I guess it's how to kind of in, engage parents while understanding that there's a, a boundary of what you can and can't do and how to kind of bridge that gap there's this expectation that um, kind of every like you've got a whatsapp group with parents on and there's every kind of opinion is voiced um and it's kind of how to hear that um while also trying to establish that there is this boundary and what we're trying to do is kind of i guess best for your sailors best for your kids and i guess it, i don't really know if it's a question there um but it's kind of i guess it's that challenge of trying to in involve parents which i think generally we do quite a good job of but also trying to establish where those boundaries are of, um, yeah, I'm not sure there's a question there, but. So, uh, thank you, Jess. It's, it's actually a really, really good insight. I haven't done a lot of work really at all in sailing. I don't think I've ever been on a, a sailing boat, if that is even the right language, but um, maybe two comments. Number one, um, when you make the comment that I think we do a pretty good job to engage parents and work with them. Um, I think that's fantastic to hear. It's, it's really um you know, many clubs can't actually even get to that point. Um, so that's really um, a positive step. I just wonder whether the creation of boundaries and the creation of expectations and then the maintenance of expectations is something that is periodically assessed across the season, okay? I'm not sure how long the season might be. Let's say it's 20 weeks. Um, there's, in, in the research and certainly in the work that I've, I've done for, you know, over sort of 12 years now, is that there tends to be a high emphasis early on to work with parents. And then once you've established those boundaries, you're set for the season. And I just think it might be worth revisiting and checking in from time to time. And, and that may be happening already. Um, but if it's not, that might be the first thing to consider. How often do we re-engage our stakeholders um, in, in negotiating, you know, um, you know, the way in which we communicate, just as, as one example. Um, the other point that, that you raised, which I thought was quite interesting with the, um, the example of sailing, is that um, I think there's, there's an inevitable burden or a perceived burden with some of this conversation because um, how far do you go and how far do you entertain the parent voice? And I've actually published a paper just recently on sport parenting during COVID, um, it's published in Psychology, Sport and Exercise. So I encourage you to have a look at that one. Um, but what I'm really highlighting is that during this pandemic, especially parents, as I said, have been have been thrust to the forefront of the provision of sport. And so now that's something that as the, the risk of the pandemic persists, but um, the way in which it's impacting our life is starting to recede. I think that um, it's worth thinking about what does this mean for clubs? Because the knowledge that we have about parenting pre-COVID um, has changed. The, the goalposts have shifted and so maybe in that paper there might be some things that you can think about about re-engaging families in the context of a, a global pandemic cool. thank you very much that was really good thanks so much sam and um, thank you especially for getting up super early um, uh, in, in sydney um, just after 7 a.m now so we really appreciate it um, thanks for contributing your chapter uh, and for that amazing uh, webinar tonight. Um, Sam, just if anyone wants to get in touch and learn more, um, how can they do that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Sam Elliot E double L I O double T at flinders.edu.au. So that's my email. Uh, and Twitter. Um, so my Twitter handle is at Sam underscore Elliot 
FU, sounds horrible saying that, Flinders University. Um, so um, Sam underscore Elliot FU and uh, um, yes, feel free to reach out. Um, more than happy to have a conversation about this really important topic. Amazing, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for joining us. So we will be having a break over the Christmas period. Um, so I want to wish everyone uh, an excellent December and Christmas. And we will be coming back with the Mr. Spot Coaching webinars in January. So please look out for, um, for the advertisement of the sign up for the webinar.